So, good morning, everybody. Um, Turn your Bible, if you would, to Romans chapter 9. Uh, Romans chapter 9. And uh, this morning, God helping me. And I say God helping me because I need God's help. (laughs) And every day I need it. And I especially need it uh, in preaching His words. And I especially need it when preaching His words where they concern uh, His chosen people, Israel. Amen. And He said, I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. And I don't want to be found, I don't want to be the guy found uh, going off and saying something stupid and wrong about Israel. Uh, I want to say what God says about it. And so that's why I'm not in a hurry trying to run through these things just to cover it. Uh, I'm Take my time, uh, make sure I get it, make sure I get it right, make sure I'm reading what's written on the page. Um, and not reading my own stuff into it, or the pressure from people around me. Uh, but what the Bible says, uh, that's one thing when I started uh, this church a uh, year and a half ago, is uh, not to get into any big deep things, but just preach what the Bible says this. Preach what the Bible says, and uh, you can, and that'll take you a long way, if not all the way. Amen. All right, we're going to read verses uh, 1 through 5, and uh, the lesson this morning is on the adoption, part 2. Uh, that is to say, how the adoption pertains to Israel. All right, so starting in verse 1. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption, and the glory, and the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the service of God, and the promises. Whose are the fathers? So not only do these things pertain to Israel, uh, but they belong to the fathers. Whose are the fathers? being a specific reference to the promises, but also to all these other things. The adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises, all belong to the fathers, verse 5, uh, of Israel. And of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all. God bless forever. Amen. Dear God, we thank you so much for your many blessings. I thank you for Jesus Christ and the precious blood that he shed to make the payment for our sins and for our sin, and for sinners. I thank you so much, Lord, for your blood. I thank you so much for your words. I thank you for taking care of us and having mercy and grace on us. I thank you for making it simple, for only giving us burdens that you know we can bear, and that you can certainly bear with us and for us. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, you said. And we trust you to do that. And we give you our burdens this morning. Lord, please take care of us. Please uh, lead us and guide us into all truth. Help help us to understand uh, the things that you said. Uh, help me not to be wrong. Um, but let me be wrong and you be right, Lord. Let God be true and every man a liar. But Lord, help me to only say the things that you'd have me to say that are that are true and right. And and help me not to preach in the flesh, but help me to preach as, as of the oracles of God. Lord, and... Uh, be with us. Open up the hearts and minds of all those that hear, both of those that are here present and of those that will hear later on the tape. And Lord, I pray for those folks on the tape, that you'd encourage and strengthen them, that you'd lead them into all truth, that you'd give them knowledge, that you'd add to their virtue a knowledge and to knowledge temperance, uh, and all those things, Lord, that they would, by experience of living the Christian life, learn patience. And be able to glory in tribulations also. And uh, be with us this morning. Protect us. Keep us safe. Pray for Daniel and Karen. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Alright, now, we're going to focus in on on verse 4. Who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption, and the glory and the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the service of God, and the promises. And we're talking this morning about the adoption. And last time we reviewed... Uh, 
<clears throat> excuse me, we reviewed uh, what the adoption is for Christians. That is to say, uh, that it is in two parts. That the first part of the adoption happens uh, with our spirit, as in Ephesians uh, chapter 1 and chapter 2. After that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. And it says, we have received the adoption of sons, uh, in the beginning of chapter 1. And in John chapter 1 and verse 12, it says, uh, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Uh, but that's not the end. The adoption for the Christian is in two parts. The first part has to do with our spirit, uh, Ephesians chapter 1 and Ephesians chapter 2, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, he said. And the second part has to do with our bodies. And that's First John chapter 3. When we see him, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And Romans chapter 8. The whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our bodies. For we are saved by hope, and hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? Uh, the Bible says there in Romans chapter 8. So the adoption has two parts for the Christian. The first part has to do with our spirit. The second part has to do with our body. It deals with two things. It deals, number one, with our spirit. Uh, Jesus said that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That was born of the spirit is spirit. He said you must be born again. And our bodies are are born alive and they are uh, become dead when we get saved. Now the body is dead because of sin. And our spirits are born dead, but God uh, resurrects our spirit in Christ uh, when we get saved. He said, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Wherein in time past he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, or with him, by grace ye are saved. Get it now. And hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Now what is that? That's God uh, making our spirit alive and raising it up and seating it with, seating it with uh, together with Christ in heavenly places. So right now today, Christian, if you're saved, your spirit is with Christ in heaven. That's why uh, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Because your spirit already has fellowship with Jesus Christ. Uh, the spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, he said. The adoption's in two parts. The first has to do with our spirit. The second has to do with our body. And both of those things are included in what, what it means to become a son of God. Uh, because... Because to be adopted as a son means to be declared God's son... But unlike the adoptions of this world where you go to uh, the government and they sign a piece of paper and everybody signs a piece of paper saying that this person is the legal son uh, of these people and uh, is entitled to all of the rights and privileges of a son in the eyes of the law in terms of inheritance, in terms of guardianship, in terms hopefully of love and care. But unlike that adoption, the adoption that God uh, makes possible for us uh, is that he changes our spirit, he quickens our spirit, he makes it alive, he changes our body at the, at the uh, rapture, which I don't like that word, it's the translation or the adoption or the redemption of our mortal body or the quickening of our mortal body or when we see him we shall be like him or we shall be changed, or any of the seven or eight other ways in the Bible that describe what that means, uh, which the word rapture does not accurately describe what that change uh, means uh, necessarily. 
unlike legal adoption, the adoption that God gives us is full and complete because it, it, it's physical. Uh, he says we're predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Uh, so just like a biological son in this world looks like his father, so will we as adopted sons look like our father. And uh, importantly, our brother, Jesus Christ, who is the express image of his person. And there's a whole lot more uh, to that, uh, but we are changed into the same image from glory to glory, Second Corinthians chapter three and four, and <clears throat> and we take on His image, and Ephesians four, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. See, because our bodies will be changed to look like His, and not just in appearance but to also be like his, and so will our minds. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. For then uh, we shall, I shall know, even as also I am known, uh, the Bible says. And that happens, importantly, when we see him. Uh, 1 John 3, when we see him, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And that's important to remember that. <clears throat> uh, but just by way of review, no uh, remember that no Jew before Jesus Christ is born again, because in John 3.16, Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son. In Hebrews chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, Christ is the first begotten into the world. And uh, in Romans chapter 8, verse 29, He is the firstborn among many brethren. And so the modern... A uh, Baptist preacher would have you to believe that everybody in the Old Testament is a Christian, just like we are. And they look. I remember in Bible college and an Old Testament survey, and the the instructors in Bible college would take us through the Old Testament. Uh, Brother Cash, his name was John Cash, was his name. No joke. And he um and he would point out the points in in the lies of the characters of the of the Old Testament where he he claimed that they became born again. You know, Jacob became born again when he wrestled with the angel. Abraham became born again uh, when he believed God. Uh, Moses became uh, born again when he turned aside to see the uh, the the, uh, the burning bush. But you don't read about being born again uh, anywhere in those passages, and no one can be. No one is born again before Christ because. Christ was, the sacrifice that Christ made was necessary in order for the new birth to be possible. The adoption, that is to say the redemption of our bodies, is only possible by Jesus Christ. Uh, turn to Galatians 4. And I'm trying to get through this review pretty quickly because I've got a lot of new ground to cover. But it's important that you remember these things, uh, that I put you in remembrance of them, and that you have them fresh in your mind uh, before we proceed. Uh, so, Galatians chapter 4. <clears throat> I'll keep going by it. Here it is. Uh, Galatians chapter 4. And look down in verse 4. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Which, by the way, is the same exact thing of Romans chapter 8, uh, where He said, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Uh, Romans 8, verse 16. And if children, then heirs. See? Just like now I say that the heir, as long as he a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. So remember that Jesus Christ is the firstborn among many brethren, He's the first begotten into the world. And that no Jew before Christ was born again. And that even though the nation uh, was God's son, and is God's son, uh, Exodus chapter 4, at no time is any individual Jew in the Old Testament a son of God in the same way in which uh, we are sons of God in this age. That is to say, our bodies... Our spirit is born again, uh, and our bodies are. Should we try calling? Uh, pro no, it's a poor network connection, and our bodies are going to be quickened. <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, notice also that uh, there in Galatians chapter 4, he says, Thou art therefore now no more a servant, but a son, if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Because before Christ, the Jews were not sons, uh, they were servants. Uh, for example, 1 Kings chapter 8. And let me just, let's turn there really quickly, because I didn't cover this last time. But 1 Kings chapter 8. 1 Kings chapter 8. Let's look at a couple verses quickly. Look down at verse 24. Who has kept with thy servant David my father, that thou promised him, thou seekest also, thou spakest also with thy mouth, and hast fulfilled it with thine hand, as it is with, uh, as it is this day. Therefore now, Lord God of Israel, keep with thy servant David my father, that thou promised him. So what is David here in 1 Kings 8, 24 and 25? Is he a son or is he a servant? It's an open book test. Is he a son or is he a servant? I think he's a servant. Who has kept with thy servant David my father. Now, I suppose you could be a son and a servant, uh, but not really. Because if you're a son, then you're not a servant. You have a whole other set of privileges and responsibilities. Alright, look down at verse 36. Look down at verse uh, 36. Then hear thou in heaven, and forgive the sin of thy servants, and of thy people Israel, that thou teach them the good way wherein they should walk, and give rain upon the land which thou hast given to thy people for an inheritance. So there, all the individual people in Israel are called servants. Uh, verse 36. Now look at verse 53. For thou didst separate them from among all the people of the earth to be thine inheritance, as thou spakest by the hand of Moses thy servant, when thou broughtest our fathers out of Egypt, O Lord God. So, at the time in which Kings was written, Moses was not a son of God, but a servant. David was not a son of God, but a servant. And the people of Israel, verse 36, were not sons of God, uh, but servants of God. Amen? And so that's important to remember. Alright, turn back to Romans chapter, Romans chapter 9, uh, and verse 4. Romans chapter 9 and verse 4. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bear, or excuse me, verse 4. Who are Israelites? To whom pertaineth the adoption? And just, just, just as the last time before we move forward, remember, that the adoption is us being declared as God's son, but more than that, it's us becoming God's son, both spiritually and physically, in a real way. Not in just a piece of paper way, but to where our spirits uh, are resurrected and our bodies are changed. When you're adopted as a son in this age, legally, your body doesn't change. Your relationships might change and you have uh, your standing changes, and your rights and privileges change, and your love and care change, but your body doesn't change, your nature doesn't change, but all those things change when you're adopted as God's son. Amen. Uh, which makes you a real son of, of God the Father, and the real brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. He wasn't kidding when he said uh, the first... Uh, we are predestinated to be conformed to the image of His Son, uh, that we might be that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Amen. So, how does that pertain to Israel? Well, first of all, it pertains to Israel because the Bible says, "Who are uh, who are Israelites? To whom pertaineth the adoption?" So this thing that we have, this wonderful thing that our spirits are resurrected, that our bodies will be redeemed and changed and glorified and also resurrected, that we shall be changed, that when we see him we shall be like him, that when we, uh, then I shall know even as I, uh, as I also, also I am known. And all those things that he has promised the Christian, you need to get the fact that that pertains to Israel. And we're going to cover it today. It pertained to Israel before it pertained to you, Christian. 
Now, how was how does it pertain to Israel? That's what we're going to look at a little bit this morning. And let me just preface it by saying, in no way do I claim complete understanding on this part of the subject, or the subject in general. I do not completely understand this. I am just giving you uh, the things, some of the things that God has shown me in my study of His words, and I take His words at face value and I believe them. And I believe the types that God has given about them, and the examples that God's given, and um, and that's the best I can do. Amen. But there's obviously more to it uh, than what I know. So let's look at that. How? How does it pertain to Israel? It pertained to Israel, uh, first of all, because it was first preached to Israel with reference uh, to the kingdom. Uh, John chapter 3. John chapter 3, uh, starting in verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees called Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. So he's a ruler and a Pharisee which uh, Pharisee is not a good thing to be in the New Testament. The same uh, characterized by self-righteousness and making the word of God of none effect by your tradition. The same came to Jesus by night. See, he came to by him by night because he was ashamed to be associated with him in public. Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a man be born again, he cannot see see the kingdom of God. So, so we can gather from that, that the king, even though the kingdom of God is within you, and that the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost, and that the kingdom of God, by virtue of that last verse, is the moral component, is a moral kingdom, not a physical kingdom, but there's a time coming where it can be seen. Well, you'll be able to see it with your eyes. And he said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You won't see it if you're not born again. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Which is a perfectly sound question. What do you mean born twice? See, Nicodemus is only thinking that there's one birth. You're born into this world, that's it. What other birth is there? Right? You're born in the flesh, and there's no other birth. What other birth is there? Uh, and Nicodemus is thinking. And so because that was his thinking, his question was, how can that happen twice? Because you just said born again. Jesus answered, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, see, there's two things there, born of water, and the second thing, uh, and of the Spirit. And a Campbellite, uh, we call them a Campbellite, or also, we also call them water dogs, uh, we also call them Church of Christ, uh, and that's people that believe that you have to be baptized in water in order to be born again, and this is one of the verses that they use to prove that. But read the verse. He says again, so he's talking about two different births, born the first time, born the second time. Uh, Nicodemus uh, expresses that he understands that you're talking about two births. He's just looking for where they are. In verse 5, Jesus tells him where they are, the first one of water and the second one of spirit. And then he defines water and spirit in verse 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, that's water. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. See? Water is flesh because your flesh is made of 75% water. First of all, plus, that's the thing that happens when you have a baby is that your water breaks and water comes out. So Jesus said, when you're born in the flesh, when you're born the first time, when you come into the world, that's being born of water. See? See? Not uh, being baptized, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. No, born of water. And then after that, of spirit. See, two things. Born of water first, born of spirit second. Born of flesh first in verse 6. Born of spirit second in verse 6. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof. 
but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth, so is every one that is born of the Spirit. See? Because the Spirit is like wind, uh, the Bible teaches. And if you're born again, then you are like wind. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit, he says. Say, so what do you mean by that? I mean, you can't tell where it comes or where it goes. Because if you're led by the Spirit of God, you're not following a predefined pattern that some man put on you. You're not following the formula of, for example, in America, you go to school, you graduate from school, you go to college, you get a respectable degree in any field of your choosing, and then you have a stable job for the rest of your life that you can support your family and, and, and get rich and leave a nice inheritance for your children and live in the land of opportunity and covetousness and never one time follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, which I promise you will take you away from that pattern. Because thou canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Now, that's not the subject of the message this morning, other than what it means to be born again, what it means uh, to be born of the Spirit. Because you're born of the Spirit. You're God's Son, and you follow God. Amen. Which is more than I can say for a lot of Christians. For most Christians, I dare say. And it's not that I'm any better than anybody else. I struggle uh, as much as anybody with these things and doing right and struggle with, uh, well, God, I have to provide for my family. And, well, God, uh, we have to do these practical things. And every time I question God's provision or challenge it, like the children of Israel murmured in the wilderness, we'll look at that in a little bit, not focusing on their murmuring, which God saw and hated, and, and killed many of them for it. Uh, God And God always hears it, by the way. But you should trust God, and follow God, and be led of the Spirit. Which, one important application of that, now that God just brought it to my mind, is if you're being led of the Spirit, then at no time will you question whether or not you're a son of God. Because the Spirit beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. See? If you're following the Spirit, then you know that you know that you know that you are God's child, that you are his son, that your spirit has been redeemed, that your body has already been uh, paid for, but it hasn't yet been redeemed, and that you will be like him. <coughs> See? Because the Spirit is constantly reminding you of that. The Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Alright, verse 9. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? I don't have the foggiest clue what you're talking about. <laughs> Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master in Israel and knowest not these things? See? Jesus said, How come you don't know these things? Aren't you a master in Israel? Aren't you a Pharisee and a ruler of the Jews? Verse 1. Why don't you know that you're, that you're meant to be born again? That you have to be born of the Spirit in order to see the kingdom of God? How come you don't know that? He said. Uh, which presumes that that teaching was preached to the Jews in the Old Testament. Amen. So the next question is, well, where? <laughs> All right, look at verse 11. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we know that we do know. We speak that we do know. Now, who's we? That's Jesus Christ and God the Father. And testify that we have seen. And you receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, that's the flesh, and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? That's the Spirit. Verse 13. And no man hath ascended up to heaven... But he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. Now, that's a reference to Jesus Christ, uh, but Son of Man, that's a reference to the man, Jesus Christ. Uh, that is to say, in his flesh. Um, but there's more to a man than just flesh. Uh, body, soul, spirit, First Thessalonians 5.23. And so it could also be... a uh, I believe generally Son of Man means his flesh, or emphasis on his flesh, but also inclusive of of his whole being, body, soul, spirit, 
In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, uh, the Bible says. And then look at verse 14. Oh, and by the way, before we leave verse 13, so no man hath ascended up to heaven. Okay, what about Enoch? Uh, Enoch pleased God, and the Lord, the Lord took him. Uh, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, what about Moses? Um, and he, uh, what about Moses in uh, Jude uh, verse 9? Yet Michael the, Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuked thee. What about Elijah, who went up in a chariot? See? Obviously, uh, he means no man hath ascended up to heaven in his own power. By himself, saying, I'm going to heaven right now. But he that came down from heaven... Even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. So this verse teaches that Jesus Christ is omnipresent. And I believe that refers as much to his flesh as it does his spirit. Um, but certainly inclusive of his spirit. Uh, being in heaven right now as he's talking. And right there as he's sitting there talking to Nicodemus right in front of him. He's in heaven at the same time uh, fellowshipping with God the Father. Verse 11. Alright, verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. See, so he's talking about um, uh, back in Numbers. Uh, back in... Boy, I stayed up late studying this last night, and I didn't even write down the reference. I believe it's Numbers, uh, Numbers 21. Numbers 21. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. So Nicodemus says, how, sh how can these things be? Jesus says, art thou a master in Israel, and knoweth not these things? Don't you remember, um, how that, the, uh, how that Jesus or how that uh, Moses lifted up the serpent on the pole. Uh, 21, and look down at verse 7. Numbers 21, 7. Wherefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole, and it came to pass that if the serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. See, what is that? That is a type of the new birth. See? Look and live. We just sung the song this morning. Look and live. And he said they looked on it and they were healed. They were healed in two respects. Number one, they were healed uh, for their sins, verse 7. Secondly, they were healed for, their, for, the, for their, the effect of sin on their bodies, verse 8. And in verse 9. They lived. Look and live. Everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live, uh, verse 8. And notice that the serpent, it was a serpent on the pole... And that's why today uh, the medical, the institution of medicine has for its symbol a pole with two serpents, which is a counterfeit. Because what they, the goal, because the ultimate goal of science, the ultimate goal of medicine is not just to help us get along until uh, the Lord comes back and redeems our bodies. The ultimate goal of medicine is try to accomplish this healing, this eternal life, this new birth, this uh, utopian society with no sin, without God. Which is why there's two serpents, not one. Because it's a counterfeit. But make no mistake, uh, it's not an ox on a pole. It's not a BMW on a pole. It's not a grasshopper on a pole. It is a serpent, because Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. See? Note, secondly, that the serpent is a type of Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ said, uh, in, ver in John chapter 3 and verse 14, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. 
which means that the same effect that the serpent had being lifted up in the wilderness is the effect that uh, the Son of Man being lifted up, that is to say, on the cross, uh, has on those that look upon him. Verse 15, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have uh, eternal life. See? And when God saves you, he saves you all the way. Body, soul, spirit. He doesn't do it all at once, but he saves you all the way. Amen. I was listening to something the other day, and Dr. Ruckman was given an illustration. And he said, it's like you're sitting in jail, uh, condemned for life, uh, condemned to the to be hanged. And the Lord Jesus Christ comes in the window and said, uh, here's your pardon, I'm signing it, you're free. Uh, but you just have to stay in the cell uh, for a few more years till I come back. And when I come back, you'll be free. And in the meantime, your spirit's free. Uh, so you know you're free, you have liberty, you have knowledge, you have strength, you have power to be overcome sin, and you don't have to be subject uh, to sin anymore. But you still got to stay in the cell until the Lord comes back. Amen. But see, but you see the pattern here of, of uh, you should know about the new birth Jew because of this thing that happened in uh, Numbers 21. Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. You should be able to see your spirit being healed and also your body by looking uh, at the serpent on the pole. Well, how do I know that the serpent on the pole was Jesus? Turn to Psalm 22. Psalm 22. He said in one place, I am a worm and no man. Because Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross... He took upon, he's, uh, he said in First Corinthians, uh, Second Corinthians 5, that he became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He became sin. So, uh, according to the Bible, Jesus Christ lost his soul, it lost its bodily shape uh, when he died on the cross. He became a worm uh, for us. He said, I am a worm and no man. Uh, Psalm 22. Say, what's a worm? A serpent. Look and live. Alright, starting in verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me? And from the words of my roaring. Okay, why hast thou forsaken me? That's something that Jesus Christ said on the cross. So that's what he said out loud, and all the rest of these things are the things that he said uh, to God in prayer. O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not, and in the night season am not silent. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee, they trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee, and were delivered, they trusted in thee, and were not confounded. But I am a worm and no man, he said, a reproach of men and despise of the people. Say, what's that? That's Jesus Christ. That's where Jesus Christ willingly went to pay for the sins of the children of Israel and also of the whole world. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. Verse 7. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head saying he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him. Seeing he delighted in him. That was... Uh, quoted by, not wittingly, uh, but people that were mocking him um, uh, when he was being crucified. But thou art he that took me out of the womb, thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breasts. I was cast upon thee from the womb, thou art my God from my mother's belly. See, because he was, Jesus Christ was the only begotten Son of God. He was born physically of the Spirit of God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have compassed me, strong bulls of Bashan beset me round. Those are spiritual entities uh, gaping at him as he was being crucified. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring lion. Second uh, Peter 5, 8. I believe it's verse five, chapter 5, verse 8. Uh, Prowleth about as a rolling, roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. 
I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It melteth, melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me. Beware of dogs, Bible says, Philippians 3. In the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and feet. That's Jesus Christ. All of this is Jesus Christ on the cross. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. They part my garments. Among them they cast lots for my vesture. Remember that? Be not thou far from me, O Lord, O my strength. Haste thou to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. Yeah, that's right, unicorns. And that's not a rhinoceros. That's some kind of a spiritual entity um, that are present where God the Father is. Uh, verse 22, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. Alright, now here's where it gets in. Not that it's all not interesting. But here's where I want to call your attention to. I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. He said uh, that we're predestined to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So when we become a son of God, we become God's brother, also being God's sons. And uh, he says, in the midst of the congregation will I praise thee, verse 22. Keep your finger here and turn to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. And notice, he says in verse 11, uh, For both he that sanctifieth, that's Jesus Christ, and they who are sanctified, that's the church, are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. See, he's not ashamed to call us his brothers. Saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. See, he's gonna, he says, I'm gonna declare the name of God the Father unto my brethren, the church. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again, I will put my trust in him, that's God the Father, and again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. That's us. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, that's us. He also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that hath the power of death, that is, the devil. See, he had to become a man in order that he could die, because as God, he's eternal. It was not possible that he could die. So he had to become a man so that he could die, uh, taste death for every man. And look at verse 15. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. That's us. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but we took on him, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Uh, that's, he's born of Jew, of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came. Romans 9, uh, 5. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, so that's both brethren in the sense of his brethren, the Jews, verse 16, and also his brethren, uh, just people, humans, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. So in order, in order for him to be merciful and faithful, he had to experience uh, the sufferings of what it is to be a man. Verse 18, for in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. But I want you to notice this dual application of the word brethren, and that it first applied uh, to the seed of Abraham. Because even though it says church here in verse 12, talking about us, uh, back here in Psalm 22 it says the congregation. Because the church wasn't yet revealed, it was hidden, uh, and a mystery from the foundation of the world. And, frankly, it did not have to occur. Alright, Psalm uh, chapter 22, look at verse 23. Ye that fear the Lord, praise Him, all ye seed of Jacob. 
Glorify him and fear him, all ye seed of Israel. Notice the word seed. For he hath not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, neither hath he hid his face from him, but when he cried unto him, he heard. See? God hears those cries. And importantly, he heard those cries. My praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. I will pay my vows before them that fear him. The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. See that your heart shall live forever? That's eternal life. That's the eternal life of something that's inside of you. of your That's not your body. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord. And all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee. Alright, now that's a reference to the millennium where he says all nations. But he's talking about Israel and Jacob, verse 23. And in verse 26, there's a reference to eternal life. Your heart shall live forever. In the context, verse 28, of the kingdom. Uh, Jesus, Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God in John chapter 3. He said, unless a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. But here in Psalm 22, he's talking about the kingdom of heaven. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he is the governor among the nations. See? We're in the kingdom of God right now. Is Jesus Christ the governor of Syria? Is he the governor of the former Soviet Republic of Russia? Is he the governor of Australia? Is he the governor of Chad? Is he the governor of Canada? Is he the, is he the gov, is Jesus Christ the governor of the United States of America? Far from it. Not yet. Not yet is right. Uh, but don't forget that all powers of God, Romans 13, and every one of those jokers is under the hand of God and is God's arm. Uh, he is the, and is the minister of God to thee for good, the Bible says in Romans 13. All right, verse 29. All they that be fat upon earth shall eat and worship. All they that go down to the dust shall bow before him, and none can keep his, alive his own soul. So you can't keep alive your own soul. But he promises to Israel that your heart shall live forever, in verse 26. In the context of the, a coming kingdom where Jesus, Jesus Christ is the governor of the nations, where the Lord... Verse 28 is the governor among the nations. And in verse 30, a seed shall serve him and it shall be counted to the Lord for a generation. See? Now that is the church. A seed shall serve him. Uh, keep your finger here. Turn to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. The, it says it shall be accounted to him for a generation. See, we are the generation of Jesus Christ uh, because we are the seed uh, that was produced by Jesus Christ. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. See? Of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came. Uh, through David, through Abraham, uh, comes Jesus Christ. And of Jesus Christ uh, shall all nations of the earth be blessed. Uh, Isaiah 53. And look down in verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. See that he shall see his seed. That's the seed of Jesus Christ. That's the seed that shall serve him. That is accounted to him for a generation. And I don't believe that's a reference, a time reference, a generation, like the next generation, the previous generation. But it's a reference uh, to a generation. We are the pe- we are the sons of God that were generated uh, by the seed of Jesus Christ. They shall come, verse thirty-one. Who's they? I believe the generation, verse thirty. The seed, verse thirty. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born that he hath done this. 
See? He's talking about a people that shall be born that the church will declare the righteousness of God unto. They shall come, so they shall declare, they shall come, they shall declare His righteousness unto a people that shall be born. So the they, in verse 31, I believe, is the generation, in verse 30, uh, which is accounted to the Lord, for, which is a seed, which is accounted to the Lord for a generation. Now we are in Christ. And as individuals, we are sons of God, and that we might be the firstborn among many brethren. But we are in Christ. We are part of Christ's body. So, that's about as far as I can go with that. Uh, but, see, here's a reference to uh, a shall be born, a people that shall be born. That's the new birth uh, for Israel. That's uh, look and live, my brother live. That's as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have eternal life. See, that's the new birth, that's eternal life uh, for Israel, for the people of Israel. Art thou a master in Israel, and knowest not, knowest not these things? All right, uh, we looked at how uh, their, uh, in Numbers chapter 21, their bodies were healed, but also their spirits. And that happened uh, in verse 9 when he said, when he be- behold him. Uh, when you see him, and you should you should recognize those words. In fact, let's look there again. Uh, Numbers twenty one and verse nine. Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole, and it came to pass that if a serpent had bit in any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. When he beheld it, he lived. When he looked upon him, when he he, he lived. What do you mean he lived? I mean his body was healed. I mean his sins were forgiven. Alright, turn to 1 John 3. 1 John 3. And starting in verse 1, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. See? When he appears and we see him, that's when we shall be changed. That's the redemption of our body. uh, Romans chapter 8. But it's also the redemption of the body of the Jews, just not at the same time, see. When we see him, we shall be like him. Just as Moses as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. In the same way, and with the same scope of effect. So just like we are born again, the Jews will be born again. Just like our bodies will be redeemed, so will the bodies of the Jews be redeemed. And quickened. And made alive. See? Alright. Uh, say, what is that? Turn to Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. And we'll look at that a little bit more. That's a new body. That's a new spirit. That's a new heart within you that lives forever. Psalm 22. Uh, Hebrews chapter 8. And importantly, it's all those things that pertain to Israel. Hebrews chapter 8, and look down in verse 7. Actually, start in verse 1. Know the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. That's the tabernacle in heaven, the true one, or should I say the tabernacle which is heaven. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, wherefore it is of necessity that this man has somewhat also to offer. 
For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. See, there's a reason, there's a specific reason for every one of those laborious details that God gave to Moses in the mount that you have such a hard time even reading about. There's a reason for it. You make sure you do it exactly as I showed you, he said. And you can apply that devotionally to everything that you ever do for the Lord. You do it the way I said. Seek ye out the old paths, the Bible says. Verse 6, but now, and by the way, by seek ye out the old paths, I do not mean go back under the law. <laughs> Hold fast, stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Galatians 5.1 Verse 6 But now he hath obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant which was established upon better promises. For if that first covenant had been flawless, it's the, the one he made with Moses, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. See, in some respect, the new covenant is applied to the church uh, because in, in every Christian New Testament, or I mean, excuse me, it, uh, every Baptist minister who is ignorant of the word of God will preach that the new covenant applies exclusively to the church and to people that believe on Christ, and they try to make everybody in the Old Testament, that is to say the Jews and Israel, members of the church, which they are not. Although any Jew can be in the church today. But then he's no longer a Jew, he's in Christ, uh, spiritually. Although he's still a Jew in the flesh. Uh, verse 9, Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, See, I'm not even going to uh, uh, hold to this covenant that I made with them when I took them out of Egypt, that is to say, the covenant, the Mosaic covenant with Moses. It was Mo Let my people go. It was Moses that brought them out of Egypt, right? Uh, it was the Lord that brought them out, but talking about the Mosaic covenant. Because they continued not in my covenant, and I regard them not, say the Lord. So I don't need to worry about that covenant. I'm going to make a new one. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. See? Now, he's going to put his laws in their mind and in their hearts. So not just on a table of stone, not just in the scroll of a book, not just on the doorpost and on the frontlets of your garments. But he says, I'm going to write them in your mind and in your heart. You say, what is that? That's the new birth. Okay. And I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. And that he saith the new covenant, he hath made for, he hath made the first old, now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. And there are many other things, uh, that we could preach about, uh, in these verses. But here I want to focus on the fact that this covenant, this new covenant that God says, he will make, and therefore has already made, with Israel, uh, includes uh, writing his laws in their hearts, writing his laws in their mind, them being his people and him being their God, them all knowing him, him being merciful to their unrighteousness and not remembering their sins. See, what does that sound like to you? That sounds like to me what happened when I got born again. See? Unless a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, Jesus said. That which is born of flesh is flesh, but that which is born of spirit is spirit. 
All right, turn to De- uh, Deuteronomy chapter 31. Uh, excuse me, Deuteronomy. Jeremiah. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 31. And uh, in the first part of the chapter, verses 1 through 9, it uh, has to do with God restoring the remnant of Israel to their land. But I want you to look down in verse 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Notice that this covenant that he speaks of here is with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not with you, Christian. Now, you have your own covenant, uh, which is after David's covenant, uh, Davidic covenant, which is sure mercies. Uh, You have your own covenant that God's given you. And you are his son. But all those things that God has given you, they were given first to the nation of Israel. Not according to, look at verse 32, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband and unto them. Now see that husband? See how you're, uh, you're the bride of Christ, but he was their husband? And uh, the Bible is called his, or Israel is called his wife in the Old Testament. But he says in one place that he's written them a bill of divorcement. So I guess he can't be a a, a, a bishop. First uh, Timothy three. I guess God's not qualified for the ministry because he divorced his wife. But he's going to restore her back. Amen. Look at verse thirty three. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, after those days, get that. So it's not over. Saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. Hebrews said their mind and their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them, even unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Now why is that the new birth? Let me tell you why it's the new birth. Because we're we're born again, right? By the Spirit of God, and the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. But now we see through a glass darkly, the Bible says. But then face to face, 1 Corinthians 13. And then I shall know, even as I also am known. Because we have been quickened, our spirits have, but our mind still isn't all the way there, and our bodies are still not all the way there. And we're not gradually improving our bodies, our bodies keep getting worse and worse, until right about the bottom is about to fall out, and then right about then, God's going to redeem our mortal bodies and quicken us. See? And at that time, but see this condition here in verse 34? Well, they don't have to teach each other about the Lord because they already know. We're Christians. We're born again by the Spirit of God. But we still have to teach each other about the Word of God because Christ has to grow up in us, Galatians chapter 4. Because we're renewed in knowledge after the image of Him that created Him. Because we're being changed into the same image from glory to glory. See? But this thing in Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 34 All of that has already happened to the extent that there's no more need for instruction. Because they already know the Lord. They don't need to be told about the seven mysteries. They don't need to be told about rightly dividing. They don't need to be told about the seven baptisms. They don't need to be told about the seven resurrections or the seven judgments. They don't need to be told about the coming kingdom. Because they're already in the kingdom. Here, when this happens. Thus saith the Lord, which giveth the sun for light by day, and the ordinance of the moon and of the stars for light by night, which divideth the sea when the waves thereof roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from me, from before me, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation uh, before me forever. Thus saith the Lord, if heaven above can be measured, and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, saith the Lord. See? But what he's saying is, I ain't never going to do that, because you can't find out the work of God from beginning to end. 
You can't discover the foundations of the earth beneath. You don't know how many stars are in the sky. Every number that you provide for how many stars you think are in the sky, you have to uh, qualify it with phrases like the known universe or all the stars that we can see or that we know about. Because you insist, you continue to insist that that uh, that you can that you can find out the work of God, that you can discover it, that you can prove it, although you can't, according to the Book of Job and the rest of the Bible, because God is eternal and you're not, because His thoughts are not your thoughts and His ways are not your ways, and as high as the heavens are above the earth are His thoughts above your thoughts and His ways above your ways, and thank God that's the case. Because I want a Savior who knows how to get me out of the problems I've got myself into. I want a Savior who can heal me. I want a Savior, and I have a Savior, who, who can take care of the problem, which is my sin, but also has promised to fix all the consequences of the problem, which is the effect that sin has had on the world, on the earth, on the universe, on my flesh, on my body. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, what sort of man soweth that shall also reap and on my soul and spirit. See? He's fixed all those things, but all those things that we have in the adoption, all those things that we have in the promise of our bodies being redeemed, of our minds being redeemed, of our spirit already having been resurrected, so He promises to Israel when they see Him. Now when is that? When will they see Him? We'll get to that in a minute. In the meantime, uh, turn to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. And I want you to remember the fact, Christian, if you're a Jew, you're listening to me, I want you to take comfort in the fact that God's going to redeem your people. Amen? Now, I'm not uh, going to address the scope uh, of, of what of what that means, of, of what is, uh, uh, because there's some questions out there about that, and, and I believe the scripture is going to deal with that as we get to that in Romans chapter 9, and again in chapter 11. Um, and I'm not ready to address that yet, and I don't want to say something wrong. But what I will address is chapter 11, and look down in verse, uh, uh, start in verse 7. Because we're talking about the adoption, we're talking about something that we have, but we just read in chapter 9 that the adoption pertains to Israel. And so I just showed you some things in the words of Jesus Christ in John chapter 3, in the Old Testament, in Numbers chapter 21, in Psalm chapter 22, in Jeremiah chapter 31, in Hebrews chapter 8, where God has promised those things that have to do with the adoption. In becoming his son, he promised those things to Israel. And now we have them, and so the natural, I say natural, I don't mean good. I mean the sinful, selfish, self-righteous, self-egotistical, uh, high-minded reaction of Gentile Christians is to think that, well, Israel messed up, now we get what they have, and they're out. Well, that ain't the case. That ain't the case, pal. We're going to read right now. Look in verse 7. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Now I believe that's a reference to the elect uh, of Israel in this context. Uh, those Jews who would receive Christ, of which you, Brother Leonard, are among them. According as it is written, God hath given them, that's the rest, uh, the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, ears that they should not hear unto this day. Hey, God has given the spirit of slumber. And David saith, Let their table be made a snare, and a trap, and a stumbling block, and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened, that they may not see, and bow down their back alway. I say then. Okay, so here in verse 8, 9, and 10, uh, and you wouldn't catch me dead saying these words if I weren't reading them off the page. But God has blinded Israel. We read about that in summary uh, down in verse 25. 
For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits. That's you Gentile Christians. That blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. See, your time is almost at an end, Gentile. Uh, but look back in verse 11. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Meaning Israel. God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. So the reason why God gave you something, Christian, that really pertains to Israel is to make Israel jealousy and to use you as a mechanism to help to restore them later. Which he will do and has promised to do. And at which time they will receive those things. As we read about in Jeremiah chapter 31 and Hebrews chapter 8 and Psalm 22. Your heart shall live forever, he said. Look and live. And not just with your spirit, but also with your body. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, there's so much in here that I can't get to this morning. Diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostles of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. Which, by the way, that tells you who he's addressing uh, when he says in verse 21, For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. He's not strictly talking here about salvation or you as an individual being saved. He's talking about you as a group, Gentiles. Be not high-minded but fear, because the kingdom is going to turn to the Jews. Because the fullness of the Gentiles is going to come in. And then will be passed. And we'll talk about that more uh, later. But look at verse 14. If by any means... I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them. See? So Paul looks at God and he sees him doing this whole thing with the Jews and the Gentiles. He's saying, okay, well I'm going to take what was promised to you, the adoption. I'm going to give it to the church. But but I'm not taking it away from you. I'm just using the church to make you jealous so that you can come back. And when you, when you look on me whom you, whom you have pierced, When you see me, then I'm going to put my law in your hearts and in your minds. Then I'm going to make your heart live forever. Then you're not going to need to have any instruction because you already know me because you'll be my children and I'll be your father because you'll be my people and I'll be your God. And all those things we just looked at. So Paul sees all that happening and he says, well, I'm going to follow suit and I'm going to um, uh, speak to you Gentiles and magnify the fact that I'm the apostles of the Gentiles, verse 13, if by some chance I might uh, provoke to emulation, that is to say, jealousy, verse 11, them which are my flesh, and might save some of them. See? I want to I want to provoke any Jew that I come in contact with to jealousy by emphasizing the fact that I'm a Jew, but I'm, uh, I'm the apostles of the Gentiles. And I'm preaching to the Gentiles, and I'm telling the Gentiles about all those things. But take heed, Gentile, because uh, look at verse 15. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? See, there's a literal resurrection from the dead here in verse 15 that I will address when we get to that, not this morning. For if the first fruit be holy, that has to do with Israel, Ezekiel 37, for if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, that's the Jews, and thou, being a wild olive tree, that's Gentiles, even on a, from a different tree altogether, were grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree, See, because the adoption, because salvation is of the Jews, because the adoption pertains to Israel, because the glory pertains to Israel, because the covenants pertain to Israel, but according to Romans chapter 4, that he might be the father of all them that believe, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. See? Say, what is that? That's this thing here in verse 17. 
That's you being a wild olive tree being grafted in. Boast not thyself against the branches. See? Don't get heady and high-minded and think that just because you got grafted in that God's all done with Israel and you take what belongs to them. Because that is a lie of the devil. God is not done with them. He said, the minute you can count all the stars, the day I'll cast off Israel. Have you done it yet? Have you done it? Dr. Urban used to have a thing where he said, I'll give a thousand dollars to anybody who can prove a mistake in the King James Bible. Well, God does one better than that. He says, I'll cast, I'll cast off Israel the minute you can count all the stars in the heaven. Any takers? Any takers? I didn't think so. Well, I, can, I, I can count. I can count them. No, you miss one. You miss five. You miss five billion. You miss a hundred million universes that you don't even know about because you can't see them because we see through a glass darkly. And the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmness showeth forth His handiwork. It declares and it shows forth. But you don't see God's glory. It's just declared to you. See, with words and with a picture. So boast not thyself against the branches, Gentile, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Because that's, that's how highly you think of yourself, Gentile. Because you're so conceited, you think everything's about you. What this chapter is telling you, what all the chapters that we looked at today are telling you, is that yes, you are a son of God. Yes, you are God's children. And some of you are so egotistical and conceited that you couldn't even bring yourself to learn that much. But some of you have learned that much, and you're still so e- egotistical and conceited that you haven't yet learned that those things pertain to Israel. And that God only gave them to you to provoke Israel to jealousy. And yes, you really have them. But it's not just about you. See? The branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. I just hear you just saying it. as just a proud kid with your stiff neck. The branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. See? Not you as an individual, like you can lose your salvation. But you, as a Gentile, because God very quickly is going to do a short work upon the earth because the times of the Gentiles are at an end and God is going to return the kingdom to Israel. Verse 22, Behold therefore the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness, excuse me, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shall be cut off. Speaking of the Gentiles. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in again, for God is able to graft them in again. Praise God for that. For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, see, and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, you need to remember the fact that what happened with you is against nature, the good things that God has given you. You were just some part of live olive tree or wild olive tree, and it was fit to be burned. And God cut you out of that tree and put you in the good tree. How much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? See, it's their tree that you're grafted into, Gentile. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, that you should be wise in your own conceits. That blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So what are you talking about? I'm talking about the adoption of sons. I'm talking about the fact that it pertains to Israel. I'm talking about the uh, the fact that Israel uh, is promised that they will be his children uh, in the millennium. Uh, that the church will declare the righteousness of Jesus Christ and of God, unto the Jews. And I'm talking about the new birth for Israel, which is the adoption, and which includes uh, their spirit being born again, uh, their bodies being redeemed, 
the adoption of sons, that they will be God's people, uh, that they will be God's children, and that they will attain unto the righteousness of God, uh, which is by faith at that time. Mm-hmm. Praise God uh, for the children of Israel. And Lord, I know this is a complicated subject. I know there's a lot there. And I try my best to believe everything you wrote. Please forgive me if I missed something. Uh, please forgive me if I went too far. I hope I didn't. And Lord, if I'm wrong, please correct me so I don't stay in, in stupidness. But Lord, I, I just read these things off your page and I, and I, and I applied the things that you said. Art thou a master in Israel and knowest not these things? He said to, to uh, Nicodemus, and I don't, I don't want to be the guy who you look at and say, how come you don't know these things? I said it right there in Numbers 21. Help me to be the guy who believes. Help me to be the guy who has discernment and understands by the Holy Spirit of God as I follow you in, in words taught by the Holy Ghost. And I pray that you open up the hearts and minds of those that hear this morning. And uh, maybe uh, maybe you're not a Jew, maybe you're a Greek, maybe you're not a Greek, maybe you're a Jew in the flesh, but maybe you've never been more again. And you don't have to wait for the second coming to receive the mercy and the covenant uh, of Jesus Christ. You can believe on Jesus Christ and be saved right now today. You can have your spirit quickened today. You can be raised to walk in newness of life. You can be forgiven for your sins. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. In thy house. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Still there, brother?